The Wall by Jean-Paul Sartre They pushed us into a big white room and I began to blink because the light hurt my eyes. Then I saw a table and four men behind the table, civilians, looking over the papers. They'd bunched another group of prisoners in the back and we had to cross the whole room to join them. There were several I knew and some others who must have been foreigners. The two in front of me were blonde with round skulls they looked alike. I supposed they were French. The small one kept hitching up his pants. Nerves. It lasted about three hours. I was dizzy and my head felt empty, but the room was well heated and I found that pleasant enough. For the past 24 hours we hadn't stopped shivering. The guards brought the prisoners up to the table, one after the other. The four men asked each one his name and occupation. Most of the time they didn't go any further, or they would simply ask a question here and there. Did you have anything to do with the sabotage of munitions? Or, where were you the morning of the 9th and what were you doing? They didn't listen to the answers, or at least didn't seem to. They were quiet for a moment, looking straight in front of them, and then began to write. They asked Tom if it were true he was in the International Brigade. Tom couldn't tell them otherwise because of the papers they found in his coat. They didn't ask Juan anything, but they wrote for a long time after he told them his name. My brother Jose is the anarchist, Juan said. You know he isn't here anymore. I don't belong to any party. I never had anything to do with politics. They didn't answer. Juan went on. I haven't done anything. I don't want to pay for somebody else. His lips trembled. A guard shut him up and took him away. It was my turn. Your name is Pablo Ibiera? Yes. The man looked at the papers and then asked me, Where is Ramon Gris? I don't know. You hit him in your house from the 6th to the 19th? No. They wrote for a minute, and then the guards took me out. In the corridor, Tom and Juan were waiting between two guards. We started talking. Tom asked one of the guards, So? So what? the guard said. Was that the cross-examination or the judgment? Judgment, the guard said. What are they going to do with us? The guard answered dryly. Sentence will be read in your cell. As a matter of fact, our cell was one of the hospital cellars. It was terrifically cold there because of the drafts. We shivered all night and it wasn't much better during the day. I had spent the previous five days in a cell in a monastery, a sort of hole in the wall that must have dated from the Middle Ages. Since there was a lot of prisoners and not much room, they locked us up anywhere. I didn't miss my cell. I hadn't suffered too much from the cold, but I was alone. After a while, it gets irritating. In the cellar, I had company. Juan hardly ever spoke. He was afraid, and he was too young to have anything to say. But Tom was a good talker, and he knew Spanish very well. There was a bench in the cellar and four mats. When they took us back, we sat and waited in silence. After a long moment, Tom said, We're screwed. I think so too, I said. But I don't think they'll do anything to the kid. They don't have a thing against him, said Tom. He's the brother of a militiaman, and that's all. I looked at Juan. He didn't seem to hear. Tom went on. You know what they do in Saragossa? They lay the men down on the road and run over them with trucks. A Moroccan deserter told us that. They said it was to save ammunition. It doesn't save petrol, I said. I was annoyed at Tom. He shouldn't have said that. Then there's officers walking along the road, he went on supervising it all. They stick their hands in their pockets and smoke cigarettes. You think they finish off the guys? Hell no, they let them scream, sometimes for an hour. The Moroccan said he damn near puked the first time. I don't believe they'll do that here, I said, unless they're really short on ammunition. 
The light came in through four air holes and a round opening they had made in the ceiling on the left, and you could see the sky through it. Through this hole, usually closed by a trap, they unloaded coal into the cellar. Just below the hole there was a big pile of coal dust. It had been used to heat the hospital, but since the beginning of the war the patients were evacuated and the coal stayed there, unused. Sometimes it even got rained on because they had forgotten to close the trap. Dom began to shiver. Good Jesus Christ, I'm cold, he said. Here it goes again. He got up and began to do exercises. At each movement his shirt opened on his chest, white and hairy. He lay on his back, raised his legs in the air and bicycled. I saw his great rump trembling. Tom was husky, but he had too much fat. I thought how rifle bullets or the sharp points of bayonets would soon be sunk into this mass of tender flesh as in a lump of butter. It wouldn't have made me feel like that if he'd been thin. I wasn't exactly cold, but I couldn't feel my arms and shoulders anymore. Sometimes I had the impression I was missing something and began to look around for my coat and then suddenly remembered they hadn't given me a coat. It was rather uncomfortable. They took our clothes and gave them to their soldiers, leaving us only our shirts and those canvas pants that hospital patients wear in the middle of summer. After a while, Tom got up and sat next to me, breathing heavily. Warmer? Good Christ, no, but I'm out of wind. Around eight o'clock in the evening, a major came in with two phalangistas. He had a sheet of paper in his hand. He asked the guard, What are the names of those three? Steinbock, Ibietta, and Merbel, the guard said. The major put on his eyeglasses and scanned the list. Steinbock, Steinbock. Oh yes, you are sentenced to death. You will be shot tomorrow morning. He went on looking. Uh, the other two as well. That's not possible, Juan said. Not me. The major looked at him amazed. What's your name? Juan Merbel, he said. Well, your name is here, said the major. You're sentenced. I didn't do anything, Juan said. The major shrugged his shoulders and turned to Tom and me. You're Basque? Nobody is Basque. He looked annoyed. They told me there were three Basques. I'm not going to waste my time running after them. Then naturally you don't want a priest? We didn't even answer. He said, a Belgian doctor is coming shortly. He is authorized to spend the night with you. He made a military salute and left. What did I tell you, Tom said. We get it. Yeah, I said, it's a rotten deal for the kid. I said that to be decent, but I didn't like the kid. His face was too thin, and fear and suffering had disfigured it, twisting all his features. Three days before, he had been a smart sort of kid, not too bad, but now he looked like an old fairy, and I thought how he'd never be young again, even if they were to let him go. It wouldn't have been too hard to have a little pity for him, but pity disgusts me, or rather it horrifies me. He hadn't said anything more, but he had turned grey. His face and hands were both grey. He sat down again and looked at the ground with round eyes. Tom was good-hearted. He wanted to take his arm, but the kid tore himself away violently and made a face. Let him alone, I said in a low voice. You can see he's going to blubber. Tom obeyed regretfully. He would have liked to comfort the kid. He would have passed his time, and he wouldn't have been tempted to think about himself. But it annoyed me. I'd never thought about death because I'd never had any reason to. But now the reason was here and there was nothing to do but think about it. Tom began to talk. Say, have you ever knocked any guys off? He asked me. I didn't answer. He began explaining to me that he had knocked off six since the beginning of August. He didn't realize the situation, and I could tell he didn't want to realize it. I hadn't quite realized it myself. I wondered if it hurt much. I thought of bullets. I imagined their burning hail through my body. All that was beside the real question, but I was calm. We had all night to understand. After a while, Tom stopped talking, and I watched him out of the corner of my eye. I saw he, too, had turned grey and looked rotten. I told myself, now it starts. It was almost dark. A dim glow filtered through the air holes, and the pile of coal 
and made a big stain beneath the spot of sky. I could already see a star through the hole in the ceiling. The night would be pure and icy. The door opened and two guards came in, followed by a blonde man in a tan uniform. He saluted us. I am the doctor, he said. I have authorization to help you in these trying hours. He had an agreeable and distinguished voice. I said, what do you want here? I am at your disposal. I shall do all I can to make your last moments less difficult. What did you come here for? There's others, the hospital's full of them. I was sent here, he answered with a vague look. Ah, would you like to smoke? He added hurriedly. I have cigarettes, and even cigars. He offered us English cigarettes and puros, but we refused. I looked him in the eyes, and he seemed irritated. I said to him, You aren't here on an errand of mercy. Besides, I know you. I saw you with the fascists in the barracks yard the day I was arrested. I was going to continue, but something surprising suddenly happened to me. The presence of this doctor no longer interested me. Generally, when I'm on somebody, I don't let go, but the desire to talk left me completely. I shrugged and turned my eyes away. A little later, I raised my head. He was watching me curiously. The gods were sitting on a mat. Pedro, the tall, thin one, was twiddling his thumbs. The other shook his head from time to time to keep from falling asleep. Do you want a light? Pedro suddenly asked the doctor. The other nodded yes. I think he was about as smart as a log, but he surely wasn't bad. Looking in his cold blue eyes, it seemed to me that his only sin was lack of imagination. Pedro went out and came back with an oil lamp, which he set on the corner of the bench. It gave bad light, but it was better than nothing. They had left us in the dark the night before. For a long time, I watched the circle of light the lamp made on the ceiling. I was fascinated. Then suddenly I woke up. The circle of light disappeared and I felt myself crushed under an enormous weight. It was not the thought of death or fear. It was nameless. My cheeks burned and my head ached. I shook myself and looked at my two friends. Tom had hidden his face in his hands. I could only see the fat white nape of his neck. Little Juan was the worst. His mouth was open and his nostrils trembled. The doctor went and put his hand on his shoulder as if to comfort him, but his eyes stayed cold. Then I saw the Belgian's hand drop stealthily along Juan's arm down to the wrist. Juan paid no attention. The Belgian took his wrist between three fingers distractedly, the same time drawing away a little and turning his back to me. But I leaned backward and saw him take a watch from his pocket and look at it for a moment, never letting go of the wrist. After a minute, he had let the hand fall a nut and went and leaned back against the wall. Then, as if he suddenly remembered something very important which had to be jotted down on the spot, he took a notebook from his pocket and wrote a few lines. Bastard, I thought angrily. Let him come and take my pulse. I'll shove my fist in his rotten face. He didn't come, but I felt him watching me. I raised my head and returned his look. Impersonally, he said to me, Doesn't it seem cold to you here? He looked cold. He was blue. I'm not cold, I told him. He never took his hard eyes off me. Suddenly I understood and my hands went to my face. I was drenched in sweat. In this cellar, in the midst of winter, in the midst of drafts, I was sweating. I ran my hands through my hair, gummed together with perspiration. At the same time, I saw my shirt was damp and sticking to my skin. I had been dripping for an hour and hadn't felt it. But that swine of a Belgian hadn't missed a thing. He had seen the drops rolling down my cheeks and thought, this is the manifestation of an almost pathological state of terror and he had felt normal and proud of being so because he was cold. I wanted to stand up and smash his face, but no sooner had I made the slightest gesture than my rage and shame were wiped out. I fell back onto the bench with indifference. I satisfied myself by rubbing my neck with my handkerchief because now I felt the sweat dropping from my hair onto my neck and it was unpleasant. I soon gave up rubbing, it was useless. 
My handkerchief was already soaked and I was still sweating. My buttocks were sweating too and my damp trousers were glued to the bench. Suddenly one spoke. You're a doctor? Yes, said the Belgian. Does it hurt? Very long? Eh, when? Oh, no, the Belgian said paternally. Not at all, it's over quickly. He acted it as though he were calming a cash customer. But I, they told me, sometimes they have to fire twice. Sometimes, the Belgian said, nodding. It may happen that the first volley reaches no vital organs. Then they have to reload their rifles and aim all over again. He thought for a moment and then added hoarsely, that takes time. He had a terrible fear of suffering. It was all he thought about. It was his age. I never thought much about it. It wasn't fear of suffering that made me sweat. I got up and walked to the pile of coal dust. Tom jumped up and threw me a hateful look. I had annoyed him because my shoes squeaked. I wondered if my face looked as earthy as his. I saw he was sweating too. The sky was superb. No light filtered into the dark corner and I had only to raise my head to see the Big Dipper. But I wasn't like it had been. The night before I could see a great piece of sky from my monastery cell and each hour of the day brought me a different memory. Morning. When the sky was a hard light blue, I thought of beaches on the Atlantic. At noon, I saw the sun and I remembered a bar in Seville where I drank manzanilla and ate olives and anchovies. Afternoons, I was in the shade and I thought of the deep shadow which spreads over half a bullring, leaving the other half shimmering in sunlight. It was really hard to see the whole world reflected in the sky like that. But now I could watch the sky as much as I pleased. It no longer evoked anything in me. I liked that better. I came back and sat near Tom. A long moment passed. Tom began speaking in a low voice. He had to talk. Without that, he wouldn't have been able to recognize himself in his own mind. I thought he was talking to me, but he wasn't looking at me. He was undoubtedly afraid to see me as I was, grey and sweating. We were alike and worse than mirrors of each other. He watched the Belgian, the living. Do you understand, he said. I don't understand. I began to speak in a low voice, too. I watched the Belgian. Why? What's the matter? Something is going to happen to us that I can't understand. There was a strange smell about Tom. It seemed to me I was more sensitive than usual to odours. I grinned. You'll understand in a while. It isn't clear, he said obstinately. I want to be brave, but at least I have to know. Listen, they're going to take us into the courtyard. Good. They're going to stand up in front of us. How many? I don't know. Five or eight. Not more. All right, there'll be eight. Someone will holler, aim. I'll see eight rifles looking at me. I'll think how I'd like to get inside the wall. I'll push against it with my back. With every ounce of strength I have, the wall will stay like in a nightmare. I can imagine all that. If you only knew how well I can imagine it. All right, all right, I said, I can imagine it too. It must hurt like hell. You know, they aim at the eyes and the mouth to disfigure you, he added maliciously. I can feel the wounds already. I've had pains in my head and in my neck for the past hour. Not real pains, worse. This is what I'm going to feel tomorrow morning. And then what? I well understood what he meant, but I didn't want to act as if I did. I had pains too. Pains in my body like a crowd of tiny scars. I couldn't get used to it. But I was like him. I attached no importance to it. After, I said, you'll be pushing up daisies. He began to talk to himself. He never stopped watching the Belgian. The Belgian didn't seem to be listening. I knew what he had come to do. He wasn't interested in what we thought. He came to watch our bodies. Bodies dying in agony while yet alive. It's like a nightmare, Tom was saying. You want to think something. You always have the impression that it's all right, that you're going to understand it and then it slips. It escapes you and fades away. I tell myself there will be nothing afterwards, but I don't understand what it means. 
Sometimes I almost can, and then it fades away and I stop thinking about the pains again, bullets, explosions. I'm a materialist, I swear to you, I'm not going crazy, but something's the matter. I see my corpse. That's not hard, but I'm the one who sees it, with my eyes. I've got to think, think that I won't see anything anymore and the world will go on for the others. We aren't made to think that, Pablo. Believe me, I've already stayed up a whole night waiting for something, but this isn't the same. This will creep up behind us, Pablo. We won't be able to prepare for it. Shut up, I said. Do you want me to call a priest? He didn't answer. I'd already noticed they had a tendency to act like a prophet and call me Pablo, speaking in a toneless voice. I didn't like that. But it seems all the Irish are that way. I had the vague impression he smelled of urine. Fundamentally, I hadn't much sympathy for Tom, and I didn't see why, under the pretext of dying together, I should have any more. It would have been different with some others, with Ramon Gris, for example. But I felt alone between Tom and Juan. I liked that better anyhow. With Ramon, I might have been more deeply moved. But I was terribly hard just then, and I wanted to stay hard. He kept on chewing his words with something like distraction. He certainly talked to keep himself from thinking. He smelled of urine like an old prostate case. Naturally, I agreed with him. I could have said everything he said. It isn't natural to die. And since I was going to die, nothing seemed natural to me. Not this pile of coal dust, or the bench, or Pedro's ugly face. Only it didn't please me to think the same things as Tom. And I knew that, all through the night, every five minutes, we would keep on thinking things at the same time. I looked at him sideways, and for the first time he seemed strange to me. He wore death on his face. My pride was wounded. For the past twenty-four hours I had lived next to Tom, and I had listened to him. I had spoken to him, and I knew we had nothing in common. And now we looked as much alike as twin brothers, simply because we were going to die together. Tom took my hand without looking at me. Pablo, I wonder. I wonder if it's really true that everything ends. I took my hand away and said, Look between your feet, you pig. There was a big puddle between his feet and drops fell from his pants leg. What is it? he asked, frightened. You're pissing in your pants, I told him. It isn't true, he said furiously. I'm not pissing. I don't feel anything. The Belgian approached us. He asked with false solicitude, Do you feel ill? Tom did not answer. The Belgian looked at the puddle and said nothing. I don't know what it is, Tom said ferociously, but I'm not afraid. I swear I'm not afraid. The Belgian did not answer. Tom got up and went to piss in a corner. He came back, buttoning his fly, and sat down without a word. The Belgian was taking notes. All three of us watched him because he was alive. He had the motions of a living human being, the cares of a living human being. He shivered in the cellar the way the living are supposed to shiver. He had an obedient, well-fed body. The rest of us hardly felt ours, not in the same way, anyhow. I wanted to feel my pants between my legs, but I didn't dare. I watched the Belgian balancing on his legs, master of his muscles, someone who could think about tomorrow. There we were, three bloodless shadows. We watched him, and we sucked his life like vampires. Finally, he went over to little Juan. Did he want to feel his neck for some professional motive, or was he obeying an impulse of charity? If he was acting by charity, it was the only time during the whole night. He caressed Juan's head and neck. The kid let himself be handled, his eyes never leaving him. Then suddenly, he seized the hand and looked at it strangely. He held the Belgian's hand between his own two hands, and there was nothing pleasant about them. Two grey pincers gripping his fat and reddish hand. I suspected what was going to happen, and Tom must have suspected it too. But the Belgian didn't see a thing. He smiled paternally. After a moment, the kid brought the fat red hand to his mouth and tried to bite it. The Belgian pulled away quickly and stumbled back against the wall. For a second, he looked at us with horror. He must have suddenly understood that we were not men like him. 
I began to laugh and one of the guards jumped up. The other was asleep, his wide open eyes were blank. I felt relaxed and overexcited at the same time. I didn't want to think anymore about what would happen at dawn or death. It made no sense. I only found words or emptiness. But as soon as I tried to think of anything else, I saw rifle barrels pointing at me. I lived my execution twenty times, perhaps. Once I even thought it was for good, I must have slept a minute. They were dragging me to the wall and I was struggling. I was asking for mercy. I woke up with a start and I looked at the Belgian. I was afraid I might have cried out in my sleep, but he was stroking his mustache. He hadn't noticed anything. If I had wanted to, I think I could have slept a while. I'd been awake for 48 hours. I was at the end of my tether. But I didn't want to lose two hours of life. They would come to wake me up at dawn. I would follow them, stupefied with sleep, and I would have croaked without so much as an oof. I didn't want that. I didn't want to die like an animal. I wanted to understand. Then I was afraid of having nightmares. I got up walked back and forth, and to change my ideas, I began to think about my past life. A crowd of memories came back to me, pell-mell. There were good and bad ones, or at least I called them that before. There were faces and incidents. I saw the face of little Novarello, who was gored in Valencia during the feria, the face of one of my uncles, the face of Ramon Gris. I remembered my whole life, how I was out of work for three months in 1926. How I almost starved to death. I remembered a night I spent on a bench in Granada. I hadn't eaten for three days. I was angry. I didn't want to die. That made me smile. How madly I ran after happiness, after women, after liberty. Why? I wanted to free Spain. I admired Pierre Magal. I had joined the anarchist movement. I spoke at public meetings. I took everything as seriously as if I were a mortal. At that moment, I felt I had my whole life in front of me, and I thought, it's a damned lie. It was worth nothing because it was finished. I wondered how I'd been able to walk, to laugh with the girls. I wouldn't have moved so much as my little finger if I had only imagined I would die like this. My life was in front of me, shut, closed, like a bag, and yet everything inside of it was unfinished. For an instant, I tried to judge it. I wanted to tell myself, this is a beautiful life, but I couldn't pass judgment on it. It was only a sketch. I had spent my time counterfeiting eternity. I had understood nothing. I had missed nothing. There were so many things I could have missed. The taste of manzanilla or the baths I took in summer in a little creek near Cadiz. But death had disenchanted everything. The Belgian suddenly had a bright idea. My friends, he told us, I will undertake if the military administration will allow it to send a message for you, a souvenir to those who love you. Tom mumbled, I don't have anybody. I said nothing. Tom waited an instant, then looked at me with curiosity. You don't have anything to say to Concha? No. I hated this tender complicity. It was my own fault. I had talked about Concha the night before. I should have controlled myself. I was with her for a year. Last night I would have given an arm to see her again for five minutes. That was why I talked about her. It was stronger than I was. Now I had no more desire to see her, I had nothing more to say to her. I would not even have wanted to hold her in my arms. My body filled me with horror because it was grey and sweating, and I wasn't sure that her body didn't fill me with horror. Concha would cry when she found out I was dead. She would have no taste for life for months afterwards. But I was still the one who was going to die. I thought of her soft, beautiful eyes. When she looked at me, something passed from her to me, but I knew it was over. If she looked at me now, the look would stay in her eyes. It wouldn't reach me. I was alone. Tom was alone too, but not in the same way. 
Sitting cross-legged, he had begun to stare at the bench with a sort of smile. He looked amazed. He put out his hand and touched the wood cautiously as if he were afraid of breaking something, then drew back his hand quickly and shuddered. If I had been Tom, I wouldn't have amused myself by touching the bench. This was some more Irish nonsense, but I too found that objects had a funny look. They were more obliterated, less dense than usual. It was enough for me to look at the bench, the lamp, the pile of coal dust, to feel that I was going to die. Naturally, I couldn't think clearly about my death, but I saw it everywhere, on things, in the way things fell back and kept their distance, discreetly, as people who speak quietly at the bedside of a dying man. It was his death which Tom had just touched on the bench. In the state I was in, if someone had come and told me I could go home quietly, that they would leave my life whole, it would have left me cold. Several hours or several years of waiting is all the same when you have lost the illusion of being eternal. I clung to nothing. In a way, I was calm. But it was a horrible calm because of my body. My body I saw with its eyes, I heard with its ears, but it was no longer me. It sweated and it trembled by itself and I didn't recognize it anymore. I had to touch it and look at it to find out what was happening, as if it were the body of someone else. At times I could still feel it. I felt sinkings and fallings, as when you're in a plane talking a nosedive. Or I felt my heart beating, but that didn't reassure me. Everything that came from my body was all cockeyed. Most of the time it was quiet and I felt no more than a sort of weight, a filthy presence against me. I had the impression of being tied to an enormous vermin. Once I felt my pants and I felt that they were damp. I didn't know whether it was sweat or urine, but I went to piss on the cold pile as a precaution. The Belgian took out his watch, looked at it. He said, it's 3.30. Bastard. He must have done that on purpose. Tom jumped. We hadn't noticed time was running out. Night surrounded us like a shapeless, somber mass. I couldn't even remember that it had begun. Little Juan began to cry. He wrung his hands, pleaded. I don't want to die. I don't want to die. He ran across the whole cellar with waving his arms in the air and fell sobbing on one of the mats. Tom watched him with mournful eyes, without the slightest desire to console him, because it wasn't worth the trouble. The kid made more noise than we did, but he was less touched. He was like a sick man who defends himself against illness by fever. It's much more serious when there isn't any fever. He wept. I could clearly see he was pitying himself. He wasn't thinking about death. For one second, one single second, I wanted to weep myself, to weep with pity for myself. But the opposite happened. I glanced at the kid. I saw his thin, sobbing shoulders and I felt inhuman. I could pity neither the others nor myself. I said to myself, I want to die cleanly. Tom had got up. He placed himself just under the round opening and began to watch for daylight. I was determined to die cleanly and I only thought of that. But ever since the doctor told us the hour, I felt time flying, flowing away, drop by drop. It was still dark when I heard Tom's voice. Do you hear them? Yes. Men were marching in the courtyard. What the hell are they doing? They can't shoot in the dark. After a while, we heard no more. I said to Tom, it's day. Pedro got up, yawning, came to blow out the lamp. He said to his companion, cold as hell. The cellar was all grey. We heard shots in the distance. It's starting, I told Tom. They must do it in the court in the rear. Tom asked the doctor for a cigarette. I didn't want one. I didn't want cigarettes or alcohol. From that moment on, they never stopped firing. Do you realize what's happening? Tom said. He wanted to add something, but kept quiet, watching the door. 
The door opened and a lieutenant came in with four soldiers. Tom dropped his cigarette. Steinbock? Tom didn't answer. Pedro pointed at him out. Juan Mobile? On the map. Get up, the lieutenant said. Juan did not move. Two soldiers took him under the arms and set him on his feet. But he fell as soon as they released him. The soldiers hesitated. He's not the first sick one, said the lieutenant. You two carry him. They'll fix it up down there. He turned to Tom. Let's go. Tom went out between two soldiers. Two others followed, carrying the kid by armpits and legs. He hadn't fainted. His eyes were wide open and tears ran down his cheeks. When I wanted to go out, the lieutenant stopped me. You, Ibiera? Yes. You wait here, they'll come for you later. They left. The Belgian and the two jailers left too. I was alone. I did not understand what was happening to me, but I would have liked it better if they had got it over with right away. I heard shots at almost regular intervals. I shook with each one of them. I wanted to scream and tear out my hair, but I gritted my teeth and pushed my hands in my pockets because I wanted to stay clean. After an hour, they came to get me and led me to the first floor, to a small room that smelt of cigars where the heat was stifling. There were two officers sitting, smoking in the armchairs, papers on their knees. You Ibiera? Yes. Where is Ramon Gui? I don't know. The one questioning me was short and fat. His eyes were hard behind his glasses. He said to me, come here. I went to him. He got up and took my arms, staring at me with a look that should have pushed me into the earth. At the same time, he pinched my biceps with all his might. It wasn't to hurt me, it was only a game. He wanted to dominate me. He also thought that he had to blow his stinking breath square in my face. We stayed for a moment like that, and I almost felt like laughing. It takes a lot to intimidate a man who is going to die. It didn't work. He pushed me back violently and sat down again. He said, It's his life against yours. You can have yours if you tell us where he is. These men dolled up with their riding crops and boots were still going to die. A little later than I, but not too much. They busied themselves looking for names in their crumpled papers. They ran after other men to imprison or suppress them. They had opinions on the future of Spain and on other subjects. The little activities seemed shocking and burlesque to me. I couldn't put myself in their place. I thought they were insane. The little man was still looking at me, whipping his boots with the riding crop. All his gestures were calculated to give him the look of a live and ferocious beast. So, you understand? I don't know where Gri is, I answered. I thought he was in Madrid. The other officer raised his pale hand indolently. This indolence was also calculated. I saw through all their little schemes and I was stupefied to find there were men who amused themselves this way. You have a quarter of an hour to think it over, he said slowly. Take him to the laundry. Bring him back in fifteen minutes. If he still refuses, he will be executed on the spot. They knew what they were doing. I had passed the night in waiting. Then they had made me wait an hour in the cellar while they shot Tom and Juan, and now they were locking me up in the laundry. They must have prepared their game the night before. They told themselves that nerves eventually wear out, and they hoped to get me that way. They were badly mistaken. In the laundry, I sat on a stool because I felt very weak, and I began to think, but not about their proposition. Of course I knew where Gree was. He was hiding with his cousins, four kilometers from the city. I also knew that I would not reveal his hiding place unless they tortured me, but they didn't seem to be thinking about that. All that was perfectly regulated, definite, and in no way interested me. Only I would have liked to understand the reasons for my conduct. I would rather die than give up Gris. Why? I didn't like Ramon Gris anymore. My friendship for him had died a little while before dawn at the same time as my love for Concha, at the same time as my desire to live. 
Undoubtedly, I thought highly of him. He was tough. But it was not for this reason that I consented to die in his place. His life had no more value than mine. No life had value. They were going to slap a man up against a wall and shoot at him till he died. Whether it was me or Gree or somebody else made no difference. I knew he was more useful than I to the cause of Spain, but I thought to hell with Spain and anarchy. Nothing was important. Yet, I was there. I could save my skin and give up Gree, and I refused to do it. I found that somehow comic. It was obstinacy. I thought, I must be stubborn, and a droll sort of gaiety spread over me. They came for me and brought me back to the two offices. A rat ran out from under my feet, and that amused me. I turned to one of the Falangistas and said, Did you see the rat? He didn't answer. He was very sober. He took himself seriously. I wanted to laugh, but I held myself back because I was afraid that once I got started, I wouldn't be able to stop. The Falangista had a mustache. I said to him again, You ought to shave off your mustache, idiot. I thought it was funny that he would let the hairs of his living being invade his face. He kicked me without great conviction, and I kept quiet. Well, said the fat officer, have you thought about it? I looked at them with curiosity as insects of a very rare species. I told them, I know where he is. He is hidden in the cemetery, in a vault or in the gravedigger's shack. It was a farce. I wanted to see them stand up buckle their belts and give orders busily. They jumped to their feet. Let's go, Morlez. Get fifteen men from Lieutenant Lopez. You, the little fat man said. I'll let you off if you're telling the truth. But it'll cost you plenty if you're making monkeys out of us. They left in a great clatter and I waited peacefully under the guard of the Felingistas. From time to time I smiled, thinking about the spectacle they would make. I felt stunned and malicious. I imagined them lifting up tombstones, opening the doors of the vaults one by one. I represented the situation to myself as if I had been someone else. This prisoner obstinately playing the hero, these grim phalangistas with their mustaches and their men in uniform running among the graves, it was irresistibly funny. After half an hour, the fat little man came back alone. I thought he came to give the orders to execute me. The others must have stayed in the cemetery. The officer looked at me. He didn't look at all sheepish. Take him into the big courtyard with the others, he said. After the military operations, a regular court will decide what happens to him. I didn't think I had understood, I asked. Then they're not, not going to shoot me. Not now, anyway. What happens afterwards is none of my business. I still didn't understand. I asked, but why? He shrugged his shoulders without answering, and the soldiers took me away. In the big courtyard there were about a hundred prisoners, women, children, and a few old men. I began walking around the central grass plot. I was stupefied. At noon they let us eat in the mess hall. Two or three people questioned me. I must have known them, but I didn't answer. I didn't even know where I was. Around evening, they pushed about ten new prisoners into the court. I recognized Garcia, the baker. He said, What damned luck you have. I didn't think I'd see you alive. They sentenced me to death, I said, and then they changed their minds. I don't know why. They arrested me at two o'clock, Garcia said. Why? Garcia had nothing to do with politics. I don't know, he said. They arrest everybody who doesn't think the way they do. He lowered his voice. They got Gree. I began to tremble. When? This morning. He bowled it up. He left his cousins on Tuesday because they had an argument. There were plenty of people to hide him, but he didn't want to owe anything to anybody. He said, I'd go and hide in Ibieta's place. But they got him, so I'll hide in the cemetery. In the cemetery? Yes, what a fool. Of course they went by there this morning. That was sure to happen. They found him in the gravedigger's shack. He shot at them and they got him. In the cemetery! Everything began to spin and I found myself sitting on the ground. I laughed so hard I cried.